Today is January the 2nd, 2024, here in Long Prairie, Minnesota. The epistle for this Mass of the Most Holy Name of Jesus is taken from the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 4. In those days, Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, said, Rulers of the world and elders, if we are on trial today about a good work done to a cripple, as to how this man has been cured, be it known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God has raised from the dead, even in this name does he stand here before you healed. This is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given to man by which we must be saved. The Holy Gospel. From St. Luke, chapter 2. At that time, when eight days were fulfilled for the circumcision of the child, his name was called Jesus, the name given him by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. Thus are the words of the Holy Gospel. <clears throat> in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, Amen. This Mass begins with the introit, In the name of Jesus, every knee should bend of those in heaven, on earth, and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that the Lord Jesus Christ is in the glory of the Father. How terrible it is to hear in public places the name of our Lord Jesus Christ blasphemed. You hear many worldly people laugh and tell jokes, I've even had to correct a uh, plane steward on the airplane serving his uh, drinks. And, you know, they talk to people, but I heard him, he took the name of Jesus Christ in vain twice. And I, I said to him, look, you are using the name of your judge who will judge you at the hour of your death. Have respect for his name. So when we hear the name of Jesus blasphemed at least make the sign of the cross or at least say publicly blessed be the name of jesus forever or blessed be the name of god blasphemy is the language of hell if you could put a tape recorder down to the fires of hell if you could sort it out between all the groans and screaming and howling and the devil's grunting and growling you would hear often the name of Jesus Christ blasphemed because hell is full of hate. And on earth, when men blaspheme the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, it is a foretaste of hell. So what church of all the phony religions on earth and the true religion, which one has the greatest veneration and respect for the name of Jesus. And it is only the Catholic Church of tradition, because in the Navasoto, they don't bow their head at the name of Jesus. There is no interruption of removing the Berettas when, at a, let's just say, at a, at a high mass or a solemn high mass, when the priest, deacon, and subdeacon are sitting during the Gloria Nexosis Deo of the mass when it's being chanted in Gregorian chant, they remove the Beretta at the name of Jesus. That's all gone in the Navasordo. So is the Beretta. <laughs> so the only <clears throat> religion that shows veneration for the name of Jesus Christ is the Catholic religion of the, and the Church of Tradition. The Catholic religion of tradition. Not the conciliar church of Vatican II, but the traditional faith. The priest... It's, it's in the rubrics of the Mass. He must bow his head at the name of Jesus. And he's, if he's on the epistle side, he must turn towards the tabernacle and bow his head towards the tabernacle, the crucifix, at the name of Jesus Christ. 
So let us uh, love the name of Jesus Christ, adore who he is. What does Jesus Christ mean? It was given by Saint Gabriel, the archangel, when he came down from the throne of God at the, on March 25th at the Annunciation. And he told the most blessed Virgin Mary, his name will be called Yeshua, in Hebrew, Jesus. And often you see in Catholic iconography, you see IHS. It appears on altars, vestments. It's on this Roman Missal on the altar. IHS. Now, broadly speaking, one priest, when I was young, he told me it means I have suffered. <clears throat> but he meant it was a, just a loose English translation. But it really means Yeshua. It's the uh, it's a J H S, but the J often looks like I, and in the Hebrew language, those three letters are honored, I H S, in the, in the name of Jesus. The Jesuits were the ones to really proclaim that symbol, the name of Jesus, and put it put it everywhere, the name of Jesus with with rays of light, on the churches and stained glass window and vestments. The name of Jesus Christ. So Jesus, Yeshua, means the Savior. And the only name in the Old Testament that shines with the name of Yeshua is what, what we normally call Joshua. Joshua was the one who battled and, and uh, made the sun stand still. So he prefigured Christ who would battle, come to earth and battle against the powers of hell and conquer him by the cross and cut off his head by the sword of the cross like David cut off the head of Goliath. So our Lord Jesus Christ means the Savior or salvation. And it was given by the authority of his lawful father, but not biological father, Saint Joseph. Because the, the father has to give the name <clears throat> officially. And his name is uh, Jesus, Yeshua, the Savior. Christus, what does Christ mean? Christus comes from the Greek word, which means anointed with oil. How is Jesus Christ anointed with oil? In the Old Testament, when a priest was anointed, they would take a big basin of oil, pour it over his head, and it would drip down his face, down his beard, and drip down all over his vestments, and soak his, his hair and, and beard, and just drip down his chest, down to his feet, to symbolize the whole man is drenched in the consecration. So our Lord Jesus Christ, the moment he was conceived in the womb of the, of the Blessed Virgin Mary, the human nature wa was soaked with the oil of the divine person. So the divine person, that is the Son, the Word from eternity, the Logos, the second person of the Holy Trinity, assumed the human nature and soaked it in the oil of the divinity. So that every single thought, word, action, just scratching his head, was a, of our Lord, was a divine action, a theandric action, we say in theology. It was a divine action. Everything Christ did was holy, sacred. And the movement, the action of God, walking through the deserts, walking through the streets of Jerusalem, walking through the streets of Capernaum, walking on the waters, sailing on the boat of St. Peter, our Lord climbing the mountain of Mount Tabor. Every single action was the action of God. When he slept, every breath was the breath of God. Everything. When he ate. So our Lord wants us to have that same love for the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. So that we also are anointed with oil at our baptism. And you're washed in the most precious blood of Jesus Christ. You're anointed with the oil. And we also share in that divinity of Jesus Christ by participation. And this is called sanctifying grace. 
so that you also, we also, members of Christ, he's the head, we are his members, and the oil poured out over the head also pours out over the body and soaks the body into that sacred oil, which is the divinity of Christ. So we truly share in his divinity by sanctifying grace. And this is what our Lord wants of us, and all the saints speak of this. The Virgin Mary often spoke of this, especially at Fatima, sanctify and offer all our actions and duties of state out of love for God, because every action we do is also sacred if we do it in the state of grace and with the intention to glorify God, make reparation to the sacred heart of Jesus and Mary. It's extremely powerful. And this is why Our Lady complained to the children of Fatima, many souls go to hell because no one prays and does penance for them and makes sacrifices for them. But we, just doing our duties of state, really can save souls from hell, glorify God, sanctify our life, and release souls in purgatory. It really is, it really is beautiful, and what's behind it is divine love. Everything is burnt by the, the, the divine fire of charity. And that's what our Lord was. Everything was burning in his divine love of his sacred heart. It was his charity. Everything was to the love of his Father and the salvation and love of souls. It's the burning charity. Just like people who don't live in, the, in any charity and they're grouchy and grumpy and hateful and crusty. And, <laughs> and there are many people like this. There's no love in their heart for anyone. Maybe they've had tragedies in their life, mistreated by people they don't trust. And they become, they look like what their heart is. Frozen, stiff, cold, ugly even. So that's not how we're supposed to live. We're supposed to live in the divine fire of charity towards God first and our neighbor. And we must sacrifice for our neighbor, feed the hungry, give thirst to the drink to the thirsty, clothe the naked, and so forth. And then the spiritual works of mercy, which are even higher and more important, especially today. Console the sorry, sorrowful, instruct the ignorant, let them know the Catholic truth, the teachings of the church, the teachings of the saints, so they can go to heaven. And uh, to correct the sinner is also admonishing the sinner, but not like, uh, you know, I'm holier than you and you're a piece of trash and you better do this or you're going to go to hell. That's not, that's not going to work for anybody. We know that. We got it. Our Lord told us, treat others as you would want to be treated yourself. So we correct our neighbor with charity, with great humility, knowing that we also are sinners and could fall. And that's the, the brotherly compassion we must have. Saint Honoratus, who was the abbot of the monastery where St. Patrick was, off of southern France on the island of Lerin. Many saints come off, came off that monastery Many saints, St. Gaudentius, St. Patrick, and St. Caesareus of Arles, and numerous saints came off this island. And St. Honoratus was known for being a humble abbot, always quite cheerful, but always correcting his monks and his brothers and the priests. If he had to make a correction, it was with the greatest humility and sweetness and sometimes firmness, but they knew it was out of love. And this is also a lesson for, you know, parents too. They must spank, they must correct, but not out of hatred and not out of a vengefulness, but out of love for the souls of their children. Sometimes they have to be firm, but it's out of love. And the children know this when it's done out of vengeance or just venting their anger, or if it's done out of love. You know, the old saying, to spank you hurts me, then it hurts you. <laughs> but there is truth to that. There is truth to that. So, how holy is the name of Jesus Christ? How we must love his holy name. And how, how do men bow before his name in, on earth? Well, the only ones that bow to the name of Jesus and Christ present in the Holy Eucharist is the Catholic people. We're the only ones that bow. Remember, Protestants... 
Protestants despise bows, genuflections. They mock it. When John Adams, second president, came to a Catholic mass, they wanted to rally the Catholics to support the revolution against England. He wrote to his wife, Abigail, about his experience at attending a Catholic mass. And he writes in the letter, these Catholics, with their bows, genuflections, signs of the cross, holy water, kneeling, they're as if in a trance. He says, it's a wonder Martin Luther ever broke the spell. So obviously he's writing, mocking the, the Catholic Mass. The bows, genuflections, holy water, signs of the cross. We're the only ones that do it. Muslims, well, they bow to Mecca, so you could maybe say that, but they don't bow at the name of Jesus. They bow towards Lucifer. So bowing at the name of Jesus, genuflections at him in the Holy Eucharist, kneeling, signs of the cross, these are beautiful expressions of the faith with our physical bodies showing veneration to God. St. Dominic was known for his prayers, and among his prayers, he would be long on his knees or even flat on the ground with his arms out in the shape of a cross, or on his knees with the shape of the cross. He made emphasis of using the body to adore God. And this is what we Catholics do. We kneel down, especially at the, for the consecration, at the Santus, to the end of the ablutions at the end of Mass. We kneel down before God. Of course, if your knees are bad, it's an obvious. You can sit down, no problem. Our Lord understands these things. And the old people, when they come to communion, they, some of them just can't kneel down. Obviously, they receive it standing or slightly bowing. That's an obvious exception. But normally when you're healthy and so forth, we kneel down. So the only ones that kneel and bow are the Catholic people. But this fits the nature of things. We aren't Protestants who just, oh, we adore God with my heart and love him in some cloudy way with no ritual, no sacraments, no temples consecrated to God. And that's not pleasing to God. You look at all the history of God speaking to the prophets and instructing them. He instructs them, build a temple. He instructs them with ritual. He punishes them if they break the rituals, such as Oza touching the old Ark of the Covenant. No one was to touch it. And God said, if anyone other than the priests touch the Ark of the Covenant, I will strike them dead. And it happened to Oza. And Oza meant well. The, the, the ox were pulling the cart with the Ark of the Covenant, which was massive and built of gold with the propitiatory seat and the angels with their wings. Notice imagery. Images of angels were on the Ark of the Covenant, commanded by God. So God did command created images. But not to be worshipped, but to adore the God present in uh, on the ark of the covenant so when the they hit a ditch and some uneven ground the ark started to slide and oza put out his hand to stop it from falling but still god struck him dead he didn't go to hell most likely but god's touch taught the lesson you you oh, the things that are sacred remain sacred and God was teaching these things throughout the whole Old Testament. I mean, you should see the details of the priests when they enter the Holy of Holies and sprinkle the blood and their vestments. It is so detailed. And if you want to get an idea of the detail, look at the book of Leviticus. Chapter after chapter after chapter of instructions on how to handle <clears throat> the twelve loaves of the propitiatory bread how to offer the sacrifices, how to sprinkle the blood, what's to be offered, turtle doves, lambs, rams, goats, how and the different kinds of sacrifices, and the what the priest and the high priest are to wear. And it's extremely detailed. And why? Because God was instructing the Jewish people, you will have respect for the things of God. 
And this is carried over in the, in the fulfillment of the Jewish religion, which is the Catholic Church. And the Jewish religion is finished and dead. And not only dead, but for anyone to participate in the Jewish religion, it's deadly. It's like swallowing poison. It causes death to the soul. So what a scandal when Pope John Paul II and Pope Benedict participated in Jewish ceremonies and visited the synagogues while they sang that the, we're waiting for the Messiah to come. That was in 1986 with Pope, Pope John Paul II. Archbishop Lefebvre said this is a great scandal, a great scandal to the faith of the faithful. So the, the Catholic Church alone keeps the veneration and worship in the Latin rite, it's very clear and very precise, the Tridentine Mass of the Latin rite, which is the queen of all the rites because it's the rite of the Pope. But there are other, there's about 24 other rites of the Catholic Church. And the most known one is the Byzantine Catholic rite of St. John Chrysostom. And that is all chanted and the vestments worn. Even the altar boys wear a golden vestment. And the, during the consecration, they shut the iconostasis. And with incense, with the bells on the thurible, they, they surround the altar and the priest will sing the words of the consecration and sometimes even lie flat on the ground, prostrate before Christ on the altar. And so, uh, and so the Eastern Rite, the Byzantine Mass, goes way, way back to the first and second century right from St. John, who brought the Catholic faith to Turkey, to the East, and also St. Thomas the Apostle. So that's where St. John Chrysostom brought together the rite of what's called the Byzantine Rite of Mass. And it's a beautiful rite. And this is what the schismatic Orthodox still keep. Their beliefs are wrong because they reject the primacy of Peter, but their, their Mass is exactly the same as the Catholic Mass except they don't pray for the Pope. They reject the primacy of Peter and they reject that the Son, the Holy Ghost proceeds from the Father and the Son and so forth. And those are heresies. So they're wrong. And we, a Catholic cannot attend these schismatic masses nor join them. But my point is the, the liturgy, the mass is the same and it's extremely beautiful. It was so beautiful that when St. Vladimir of Ukraine in nine. 87, sent down his envoys and his ambassadors to go see the Mass in Constantinople in the magnificent Basilica of Santa Sofia, which is now a Muslim mosque. They came back to St. Vladimir, King of Ukraine, and said, we thought we were more in heaven than on earth. They were so impressed by the magnificence of the of the. Ukrainian rite, the Byzantine rite of the Catholic Mass. But that's the Eastern rite. But it's still a rite of the Catholic Church. And St. Vincent Pallotti in Rome, he, he wanted to the Catholic people to see all the rites of the Catholic Church. So he would bring in, like, I think it was like during uh, Paschal time, he would make a, sort of a display of all the rites of the Church to the people of Rome. And he would bring in Byzantine priests to say the Mass and chant it. And says so they would see the Byzantine Mass. They would see the, the Catholic Egyptian Coptic Mass. They would see the Mozarabic Rite. All these rites of the Catholic Church because he wanted to make the point, and the Pope approved at the time, which was Pope Pius IX. He wanted to make the point to show the beauty of the Catholic Church. But it's the same doctrine, the same sacrifice of the Mass, but they have developed, because of the places where the apostles went, they developed different rites of mass. But they're all full of veneration and adoration and most respectful. Nothing compared to the foolish new mass. And remember the argument of the modernists with the new mass was, well, we want to face the people. We want to put a table instead of the altar and give communion in the hand because that's how they did it in the early church. We want freestanding altars because that's what they did in the early church. This baloney from the modernists. And they're wrong because the Eastern Byzantine Rite prove 
against their arguments. No way. It wasn't just a simple table and simple burlap bag vestments and uh, around the, the sharing, holding hands around the table. No way. Right off the first, second century, you have the splendor of the liturgy with all the chanting, with the vestments, the gold, the insensations for the Eastern Rite and the Western Rite. And I, I, I emphasize again, the queen of all the rites is the Tridentine Rite of the Latin Rite because that's the Rite of the Pope. So in the name of Jesus, they have the utmost respect Everywhere, and only the Catholic people do this, bow at the name of Jesus, genuflect before him, and sometimes lie prostrate, such as at Good Friday, the priest lies prostrate, at ordinations, the priest lies prostrate. Nuns, when they make vows, in some congregations of holy nuns, they will lie prostrate. And I remember talking, just as a side note of edification, I was talking once to an old nun, of the Felician sisters in Detroit. I visited the convent there and talked to one of the old nuns, and she said that her class, there was like 21 nuns, and one of them was her close friend. And she, asked, she told her, uh, she said, I want, to, I want to, when I make my consecration as a nun, I want to die. I just want to go to heaven and see, see my spouse. I want to die out of love for him. So she said, okay, that's nice and pious. And on the day that they made their vows, they lie down on the flat on the ground, the nuns, and the other sisters will cover them with a black pall. The pall is what you cover the coffin with at a funeral. The black pall, P-A-L-L. -L. So they're, they're covered with the black pall <clears throat> to show they're dead to this world and they live for the happiness of heaven. And it's only a short time and then they remove the pall and the sisters kneel straight and they finish their ceremony. So the, the 20 of the sisters knelt up and her friend kneeling next to her, she was still prostrate on the ground and she, she tried to nudge her, her sister, it's time to kneel straight. Sister, kneel straight. She's trying to nudge her and poke her because this is embarrassing in the middle of the ceremony when families are there watching this and they're dressed in white in their marriage garb to marry Christ. Turns out her friend got her wish. She died as a spouse of Christ. That's how she died. And this old nun always remembered that. She was one of the few that still wore her habit. So, beautiful thing, isn't it? The name of Jesus. Let's love the name of Jesus and have a great veneration and respect. And fight for his name. Don't let people trash his name. And if people want to ask you, why do you, why do you make a big deal? I just say the name of Jesus Christ as if you care. Yes, I do care. And tell them, would you use your mother's name as a, as a trash word when you're angry or to curse something or... Would you use your mother's own name? Well, no. Well, why would you use God's name to blaspheme him? Because many people, believe it or not, they use the name of Jesus Christ or God, and they don't realize they're doing evil. That's how <laughs> they're just so used to being surrounded by evil, they don't think twice. And with these people, a little slight charitable instruction, they can realize and say, wow, I didn't realize that. And they stop doing it. So there are people like that. So the name of Jesus Christ, which is humble, with God always unites the humble with the sublime, the human with the divine, the poison with the remedy, to show that in Christ human nature is joined to the divine majesty. For our Lord willed, God willed, that Christ should be circumcised and thus take upon himself the appearance of a sinner, because only sinners were circumcised, but presently, when he wipes away this appearance, he gives him the name of Jesus, Yeshua, that is, the Savior, who heals all sins. So our Lord looks like a sinner as a baby at eight, eight days old, 
but in fact he's healing all sins as the Savior. So too our God willed that Christ be born in a stable and laid in a manger as being poor and abject and humble. But soon he's summoned by the star and calls the three kings, sending the star. And by the angel called the shepherds to adore him. So again, God willed that he should suffer, be crucified, and die. But at the same time, he darkened the sun with the eclipse for three hours, and the moon rent, rent the rocks and shook the earth with the tremendous earthquake at his death, that all the elements might manifest and mourn the ignominious murder of their creator on Good Friday. The more Christ humbled himself then, the more God the Father exalted him. To you, O Christian soul, he will do the same. Wherefore, fear not to be humbled for his sake, knowing for certain that by this means you are to be exalted. For the road to glory is humiliation. According to that prophecy, indeed, the promise of Christ, he that shall humble himself shall be exalted. Let's adore the name of Jesus. Let's have a great veneration and respect for his holy name. And let's make reparation for those who blaspheme his holy name. O Mary conceived without sin. O Mary conceived without sin. O Mary conceived without sin. And for those who do not have recourse to thee, especially all communists, and Freemasons, and other enemies of Holy Mother Church. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.